John Demyanyuk, he was a family man. He was living the American dream. He was a good American citizen. Up until the government came along and said he was Ivan the Terrible. Charges were filed today against John Demyanyuk, the 66-year-old Ukrainian native, is accused of being a Nazi death camp guard named Ivan the Terrible. The crimes that he was accused of were horrid. The Israeli government is seeking his extradition as a war criminal. And that's where the drama begins. Once the survivors began to testify, it became a national obsession. It was a zoo. There were news crews parked halfway down the street. His wife couldn't believe what was going on. We were looking at the fact that we may never see him again, and they're going to put him to death in Israel. The Justice Department presented evidence right from the KGB. I was sure that I would destroy the show. There was some rotten going on. My father's a very kind person, a very gentle person. Are you sure you're not making a mistake? Everybody in the courtroom went, <gasps> Demyanyo could have been a monster or a victim of wrong identity. My deepest fear is that I think he can be anybody. My next guest is a director and an editor known for the Oslo Diary, Censored Voices, and the very recent The Devil Next Door. His name is Daniel Sivan. Daniel, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. No, oh, thanks for having me. So I have so many questions for you, but for your sanity, I've really narrowed it down. But my goodness, um, look, before we get to The Devil Next Door, I do want to talk about your life here. Uh, before documentaries, um, what was your background and experience? Because I, I thought I read somewhere where you know, you don't have the traditional film school background. As amazing as your work is, I don't think that's necessary, but what is your background coming into documentaries? Uh, well, actually, like, you know, I just learned, like, you know, film in high school, um, and it was pretty obvious, like, you know, I'll never find a job in that section. Um, and somehow, you know, I got into political activism and through political activism, I started making docs um, about political issues. And slowly it began, you know, being more interesting than the politics itself, just the cinema of it. So I find myself becoming a terrible human being, but just like putting activism <laughs> aside. <laughs> uh, yeah, and just documenting the miseries. Yeah, but it's 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 even though it's it's tough sometimes the storytelling part. You're and, and I'm not being patronizing here. You're very gifted at, and that's something no film school anywhere could teach somebody, and that not many people can do well. So I believe that part of it, in my opinion, Daniel, is ingrated into you. I feel like you have that 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 gift. Yeah, well, I mean, film schools are problematic in my eyes. I mean, you know, film has been around for a hundred years um, and there's not a lot to teach because, you know, the language keeps changing and it's kind of patronizing to say, uh, you know, it's been around for a hundred years, so let me teach you all about it. I mean, I would suggest people just go and learn history or go and learn literature because it's basically, it's about the storytelling and cinema is just like, you know, the technical add-ins that keep changing all the time. Is there a part that you found difficult before you got into documentaries? Was there something, not the storytelling per se, but like you, was there anything that you struggled with on the, um, the, the filming end? Is there something that you had to kind of learn along the way that initially wasn't easy for you to grasp? Um, I, I learned along the way that I am the worst uh, scripted director ever. <laughs> uh, I, I, I pride myself for making uh, the most outrageously bad um, feature um, Israel has ever known. Um, and uh, happily, it was in a very young age. So, um, you know, that, that was a, a good wake up call telling me you should really stick to documentaries. No, you're very, um, you're, yeah, you're very good at it. And yeah, and I'm, I'm sorry, I cut you off. I apologize. No, no. I mean, I, I had to learn, like, you know, it, it was a, a painful lesson just to say, like, you are no good with actors. Like, really, you know, just give it up. <laughs> um, and I mean, what, what I really love about documentaries is, A, 
you know, most of the documentaries I made or was involved in are just so, you know, ridiculously weird that, you know, that it will it will never work as a scripted. Um, I mean, the devil knows is like the classic example of something that, you know, if I would read a script about it, I would say like, this is just like, you know, not, <laughs> this doesn't really happen in real life. Right. Um, so, I mean, the beauty is like, you know, documentaries can be really wild. And the second thing is, you know, documentary characters are just amazing actors. I mean, they're, they're so much better than any kind of, you know, actor. Uh, you know, seeing like Yoram Sheftel in, uh, in The Devil Next Door, it's just, you know, we, who, who, who couldn't compete with him? <laughs> and we're going to get to him, too. I have lots of questions about him. I, I, complete, I feel like, and I was going to ask you this a little, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot. There's a lot to it. So, yeah, and do you find that, because I know in a lot of your work, there are um, there are co-directors. Is that by circumstance or by chance, or is that the way you want things set up? Because I know, I, and I'm, if I'm wrong here, please correct me. I know the Oslo Diaries had a, you had a co-director, and certainly with the Devil Next Door, you had a co-director. Is it is that on purpose? Is that something you that that helps each of you? How how does that work? So uh, first of all, like in the Oslo Diaries, I was directing it with my wife, life partner, creative partner, Mo Lushi. Um, and in censored voices, she was directing, I was cutting and now in the devil next door, it was Yossi Bloch directing and producing alongside me. Um, and for me, it really, it's always such a collaborative process. I mean, you, you can't really do cinema alone. Um, unlike, you know, painting, which is just you and the canvas, yeah, like, you know, you need all these great people to constantly give input and their insights. And, you know, also everybody has his, you know, uh, um, kind of a region of expertise. Um, you know, I, I really like the storytelling aspect, but like, you know, I can't bother with the deep research. It's really, you know, it drives me crazy. Mm. Uh, so it was great, like with this recent project, Yossi was just obsessed about the trial for years. And like every time we needed some piece of information, Yossi just like grabbed it in a second because he was like an encyclopedia for the whole case. Um, so I like it when I work with people that have really an in-depth insight. And then I can, you know, focus more about like, okay, how do we tell this story? Mm, mm. It, it, when you work with, like, say your your wife on the project, you know the Oslo Diaries, which was phenomenal. Do you find that is is it nonstop talking about the project, or do you guys find a way to just stop talking about the project and do something away from the project to take your minds off of it? Is there is there a time where you you stop and just say, you know what, enough for now. Let's do something fun. Let's do something away from the project. Um, so, I mean, it's just, you know, such a happy and blissful uh, creative process. Uh, no, I'm kidding. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it, it's a living hell. Um, it's, it's absolutely terrible. Um, you know, we, we go to work. We really, you know, we try to kill each other in the editing room. And then we go back home. We have two kids. Um, happily, we don't argue about the kids, but the minute they go to sleep, you know, we keep arguing and it goes into the night and into <laughs> the next morning. Um, and then like, you know, right about the end of the, of the project, like we are going to get a divorce. We say we will never, ever do it again. And then comes the next project and we say, okay, like I have something new, like let's do it. Um, <laughs> So um, I, I really, I, I don't recommend to anybody working with his partner. It's just, it's terrible <laughs> for all sides. <laughs> and you mentioned, uh, is his name pronounced Yossi? Is, am, I, am I saying that right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so is... <laughs> So in projects, a lot of the projects you do, and certainly Yossi was was lovely because Yossi, I am not married to him, <laughs> right. and like, and you know, we we had this separation, like you know, when work was over, 
you know, each went to his own home. And like, that was wonderful. I, that's, that's really, you know, find a partner that you don't live with. Yes, I get, I get it. And, and, you know, with you and with Yossi, I feel like the work is very personal, right? I mean, it should be personal to humanity, but that aside, it, for, for each of you, it's very personal. For Yossi, I know it's having, you know, second generation Holocaust survivor. There's other things involved. When, when, when it's that personal, it becomes really passionate. In a, in a project like that, do you find yourself, because many of your projects do involve Israel, because it's something obviously you're passionate about, it's who you are, do you find that it's easier to do a project like that, especially with somebody like Yossi, who is very uh, a pleasure to work with, somebody very um, dedicated to his work? Do you find that's, that's the case? I mean, you know, it's it's a problem coming from Israel. Like, you know, we we keep doing all these political docs, and you know, I, I <laughs> each time like a project ends, we say like, oh, you know, next time, you know, we're we're gonna do a project about butterflies or ceramics <laughs> or just anything that is not like utterly depressing. Um, and, you know, we find ourselves each time like, you know, dragged into something even more painful. And, you know, I wish we would live in a reality in which like, you know, docs couldn't survive because it was also boring. Um, but sadly, you know, there's so much wrongdoings going around. It's really hard to just look the other way. So, you know, I, I, I love Chef's Table and, you know, I, I really, I hope like one day I can find it in myself to direct something happier. Um, but right now it's just, you know, these these topics that are, you know, a part of our, you know, burning reality uh, are really hard to just set aside. No, that's that's well said. And, and I think you said this before and I totally agree with it. You want your doc, when people watch your work, you want them to have the feeling that they were punched in the gut. And, and, and I, did you say, first of all, did you say that? And second of all, I, I completely agree with you if you did. Yeah, I mean, definitely. The, for me, always like, you know, um, when I was, you know, in high school, we would see a documentary. And these documentaries, 90% of the time were like this historic docs that like everybody was falling asleep in front of the television. Um, and they were very educational and very informative. And I mean, that's really missing out on the whole essence of documentaries. I mean, you know, if you want to get some information, you should really read an essay or read a book. And books can really give you the in-depth information. But like they don't really, you know, have this gut reaction of, you know, reading an essay about the Holocaust won't make you cry. It won't make you, you know, shed a tear. Um, it would just give you the information. And the power of these documentaries is really we can, you know, create this gut reaction that is above words. It's not about, um, oh, it was so interesting watching the Demianuk trial. It's something that is more than that, something that haunts you. Um, and I think that's the goal of, of any documentary I deal with, just, you know, really trying to convey some kind of emotion. And if that emotion makes you read a book, like, you know, it's, that's, that's achieved the goal. No, again, well said. Yeah, and, and I and I, I'm nobody's falling asleep in your work. I can promise you that. And you know, the, the the movie that I wanted, the documentary that I wanted for those of you listening that we're talking about today is the Devil Next Door, a true crime tri mystery, five hours, five parts. It's currently on Netflix. Um, boy, I got to tell you, not only did I feel punched in the gut with this, Daniel, I almost feel like it hit me over the head as well. Yeah, it's it's a crazy story. I mean, it's a crazy story because it's really so extreme. I mean, if you look at it, it's, again, I mean, for the viewers and listeners who um, haven't heard about the show, it's about this guy from Cleveland in the 80s. Um, he's 65, a retired auto worker from the Ford plant. And one day, two agents from the OSI Office of Special Investigations knock on his door and tell him, you are accused of being Ivan the Terrible of Treblinka. Now, Ivan the Terrible is not a Nazi. He's like the boogeyman of the Holocaust. This is a man that just sadistically 
tortured and killed a million people, which is a number that you can't even process. Like, what, what does it even mean, a million people? And he's charged of being the most evil human in, in history. And unlike other Nazis, he didn't say, oh, I was just following orders, I was just a cog in the machine. He says, I know that there was a Holocaust, I don't deny it, I have pain for you, I have empathy, but it's just not me, I'm the wrong man. Um, And he didn't admit of doing anything wrong. For him, it was just, you know, a total mistrial of a scapegoat. Um, And then you have to ask the question, like, is he the worst creature in history or is he just an innocent victim? So that in itself is pretty daunting. Yeah, and to add to what you you perfectly described, the premise, uh, he was tried over a period of 40 years. Um, There is a little bit I want to touch on with his death later on, but, you know, how much did this case, uh, Daniel, impact Israeli society, culture, and history? I mean, it sounds like a stupid question to you, I think, because it's, I think the answer is clear, but for those listening that may have not yet watched this or, or aren't familiar with it, how much did it impact those things? Um, it actually didn't. I mean, when you think of it, um, for Israel, they have the very, we have the very heroic uh, trial of Eichmann. Um, we tried him, we found him guilty, and we executed him. He's the only person ever to be executed in Israel and ever since as well. Um, and that's how we look at Holocaust trials. Demyanyuk was considered this very strange trial, almost a mistake, almost something shameful that happened in our history. And it was pretty much, you know, uh, swept under the rug. Um, Yossi, uh, which is older than me, um, more mature. <laughs> um, he uh, he would come back from school, and back then we had only one television channel, which is pretty nuts. I mean, just think of the 80s. You wouldn't have channel one, two, and three. You had just TV on or TV off. <laughs> so yes. it got 100% ratings. Um, like the whole country was just watching this trial broadcast live for four or five hours a day for a whole year. Um, and Yossi would come back from school and just watch this trial. Um, I was born later. I was born in 1983. So, I mean, I was very young back then at the trial. Um, I never heard of it. Like, you know, I, we went, taught about it in school. You know, I knew it happened. I didn't know what the outcome was. Um, and I think like Israeli society did all it could in order just not to think about it because it was such a painful trial for everybody. Um, and the only impact that this trial did uh, give our society is focusing on the collaborators because John Demianyuk uh, was not a German Nazi. He was a Ukrainian prisoner of war that was taken prisoner by the Nazis, and his collaboration during the Holocaust and the collaboration of all these different people, um, be it Ukrainian, Polish, and from Lithuania and other countries, uh, that was the first time that the collaborators' work was discussed. Like, until now, we knew only about, you know, people like Eichmann that was a proud German. So that was new. Yeah, and, and um, again, you know, it was definitely a powerful and a very painful uh, trial to watch. I mean, a lot of those people, you could just see it on their faces. It was just very, very painful. And, and you went over Demoniak's background, born Ukraine, drafted in the Soviet Army, Nazis captured. I have to tell you, Daniel, this guy is a chameleon. I feel like no matter where he goes, he's able to blend and fit in and talk his way through anything. I mean, it's also, it's pretty amazing, I mean, seeing his life, because this is a man that survived hunger, that survived famine, um, and then he was recruited into this war that I'm not sure he even wanted to fight. Um, And during the war, um, he was injured, and, you know, his back was like... um, 
filled with shrapnel um, after a bomb exploded next to him. And, you know, he was for a few months in hospital and he went back to fight until he was captured by the Nazis. And, you know, what happened next is a matter of dispute. But he was really a survivor. And it's almost perverse to say a survivor about this man, um, mm. you know, considering the, the Holocaust survivors. But this is a man that did not just, you know, lay down and accept his fate. He was a fighter. He's He was definitely a fighter, but he's also somebody that I found like. A, so at, for me, when I'm watching this wonderful documentary, at, you know, historically, as it's going through the, each episode i found myself in a lot of you know i went back and forth i felt sorry for his family my heart went out to the holocaust victims like i'm all over the place with emotions and then as it kind of plays out you know you see him say shalom when he's talking to somebody who's you know jewish getting off the plane and asking the guard to kiss the ground he wanted to shake the holocaust of a victim uh, his his hand in the courtroom I find him kind of obnoxious as well. I don't. Sometimes I don't think he's as smart as he thinks he is. D- does that make any sense? Yeah, I mean, you know, he, he's a fascinating character. We actually had to tone down some of, <laughs> you know, the events, just like you know, to have you kind of, you know, follow it. Because, like, one example is like he t- is taken to Israel, like you know, as a plane lads in Israel, and he's taken right away to an interrogation. And in the interrogation, this interrogator, um, a Jewish interrogator named Alexis Shalom, starts asking him questions. And Demianuk doesn't want to answer any questions because for him, you know, he was already charged, so they cannot interrogate him, which is not correct. But like, you know, that's what he felt. And, you know, he got annoyed with the interrogator, so he sprang out and choked him almost to death. It took like four other guards to take him off the guy's throat. Um, and in the end, like, you know, he succeeded in punching Demianiuk, so Demianiuk let go. But, like, the interrogator was blue at that stage. Um, I mean, this is a guy that, like, you, you know, the first thing that you do when you are taken to Israel and interrogated for war crimes is not to choke to death your interrogator. <laughs> yeah. so not he, a good move. Yeah, so he, he was a complex character. Now, is the story you just described, and I'm sorry if you said this and I missed it, was that caught on tape or was that just from from what you from what they know from documents? Oh, um, we interviewed the gods that uh, sadly he passed away, um, and they don't have it on tape. Okay. Um, but we have like all the documents proving it. But you know, we just don't, didn't want the audience to say, "Wow, this guy is like guilty a hundred percent." Like we needed some shred of anything just to follow the line. So I do want to ask one question. I'm going to tell people listening, just pause it now if you don't want to hear a huge spoiler, okay? So I'll give them three seconds. One, two, three. So I have to say one thing, Daniel, and I've been dying to say this to you. My, I was convinced 100% that he is, he is without question, um, Ivan the Terrible. When I saw the federal surveillance of him and his you know, wife and family, he was up and around and laughing. This is later on, you know, uh, you know, smiling and laughing and I'm going to say, and then when he got to court and the German authorities, you know, you know, arrested him, tried him, he shows up into court looking like he's dead. He's on the stretcher. His eyes are closed. To me, that wrapped it up for me. For To me, it was like, this is just too much. This guy, he's just too crafty. I believe he is Ivan the Terrible, without question. For me, that was the scene that did it. When the federal authorities had him, you know, on, on tape, you know, walking around. This is in his 90s or his 80s, I think, walking around, doing his thing, and I said, that's, this is it. This guy is just, he is just a walking lie, you know? Yeah, I mean, you know, each time people ask me, like, you know, so uh, do you think he did it? And I ask them, like, you know, what what do you guys think? And <laughs> then they're like, you know, so, but, but, but what's your opinion? And I'm like, no, I, I really want to know. <laughs> um, because for me, you know, this case was, haunting me and Yossi, you know, for the past four years. And I still don't have an answer, um, sadly. I mean, each time, like, I mean, once a day, sometimes five times a day, I would, like, jump into Yossi's room or Yossi would jump into my room while cutting 
And I would say, like, I have some proof. I have, like, this golden proof, a golden evidence that shows why he's guilty. And Yossi would spring back and say, like, yeah, but, like, you know, I can't dispute that because we have this and that. And, like, we kept driving each other just insane about, like, did he do it? And we are still waiting for someone to give us an answer. Um, you know, there's there's so many possibilities here. And like one of the saddest possibilities is that, you know, maybe he wasn't Ivan's terrible. Maybe he was just this, you know, opportunistic collaborator that didn't kill sadistically a million people. He killed 30,000 people. Now, <laughs> when you think of like, OJ, uh, you think of somebody that killed two people. This man, in the best case scenario, killed 30,000 people, mm. which is a lot. Now, it might be, um, and I'm sorry for driving you nuts, but like it might be that he wasn't Ivan the Terrible, and he knew that. And then he gets this crazy trial around him. And he's convinced that, wow, guys, you, like, you got the wrong man. Like, yeah, of course, it's me on the ID, and I'm lying through my teeth. And, like, of course, I was in Trevniki and in Sobivo. But, like, I'm not that specific monster. And maybe he didn't meet these Holocaust survivors. Maybe he did feel like this is all one big, massive joke. And maybe he felt that, like, you know, if he was sent to Russia, he would be executed in an hour. And if he was, ex if he was extradited to France, um, they would kill him in a day like they did Klaus Barbie. And he's just, you know, going through the years saying, like, wow, well, like, you know, I'm going to be hanged. And, like, you know, it's just I'm not that guy. And, the, you know, the most painful thing about it is this is a guy that did never say you know, I am not Ivan the Terrible, but I regret my actions during the Holocaust, or I did something wrong, or even provide any kind of alibi saying, you know what, I was here, I was there. But this guy had nothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's well said. And I have to say, as you were saying it, I wrote it down beforehand. You're right. Minimally, he's participated in 30,000 deaths. In the worst case, he's Ivan the Terrible. I mean, either way, it's just he, he's he's guilty beyond belief. I just I don't know. I, I, I felt that that should have been enough for the courts to say, you know what, whether he's Ivan the Terrible, that that doesn't really matter at this point. But the fact that he participated or is a contributor to the death of 30,000 people, that's enough to say, you know what? This man does not deserve to live into his 90s. I, that's the way I see it, Daniel. Maybe that's a little harsh. Yeah, and like, you know, and on the other hand, I have serious problems, um, you know, believing these written testimonies by dead Nazis over these Holocaust survivors that really lived to tell their story and pointed to him and said, this is a man. So, yeah, it's it's problematic. I mean, you know, my <laughs> my gut reaction is, you know, I, I, I need to believe the survivors because this man did not have any credible alibi or another explanation. All he said until he died was I was never anywhere. He never even admitted being in Sobivo or in Trevniki or having, you know, his face on the card, even though it's clear that it's him. Um, so really, I mean, you know, that's, <laughs> that's, that's problematic. Yeah. And, um, and, and I'll tell you this too, Daniel, and one of the things, you know, it's, it was tough to see the survivors, you know, talking to him and just, you could see what the years have done to them, you know, and one of the, one of the tougher scenes to watch is one of the survivors who has a, a issue with his memory, which is, you know, it, it doesn't change the fact that. 10 survivors are saying the same thing. It's not like he's the only witness, but that was a very difficult scene to watch from the trials is, is to watch all of them go through their experiences, especially the one man who had lost his memory and, you know, said he took a train from Florida to, you know, but you know, 10 survivors saying the same thing should have been enough. I thought. Yeah, it's, um, <laughs> It's really, 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 um, you know, saddening. I mean, I, I, I am really grateful that I am not a judge because 
you know, was a doubt? Yes, definitely there was a doubt. Was it reasonable doubt? I don't know. Um, can I ask you this, and hopefully I follow this right. Why did, did Russia got the whole ball rolling by giving the ID and identification of, of uh, Dominiak? He, they, that, that's who started this whole process, right? Um, yeah, the, the Russians basically uh, sent over a list in order to humiliate the U.S., saying, look at all your Nazis that you are harboring going around there. Um, and for the Russians, really, the motivation was saying, you know, either you are communists or you are Nazis. Like, you know, all of these Ukrainians that are anti-Russians, just like, you know, just like smear them all, saying like, you know, they're all Nazis. But they did provide a very credible list of, yes, Nazis living in the U.S. So that's how it started. Mm. Um, one of the things that you did, both of you did, you and Yossi did, that were that was incredible that not many people talk about, and I hope I have this right, it'll be embarrassing, but um, is that you saved a lot of the trial tapes, right? Because they were in pretty poor shape when you discovered them. Is that is that correct, Daniel? Yeah, they were in awful shape. I mean, (laughs) here comes the role of the Umatic tapes. Umatic is the worst format of video ever invented. Um, It's a three-quarter inch of video that just, uh, you know, falls apart during the years. And it just starts creating this kind of weird green fungus. And all of these audio tapes just stuck together and became like one big blog of magnetic goo. Um, (laughs) So in order to... Sorry. So in order to rescue them, uh, you really have to take each tape and to bake it in a special oven for like three days. And slowly, slowly, the tape starts like, you know, um, uh, sorry, the the tape starts um, uh, (laughs) uh, falling apart and not, you know, uh, unsticking. Um, and then you can digitize it. And as you see, like in the documentaries, they're like in awful conditions now. I mean, the, the crazy thing is like if we would do this documentary in 10 years or so, probably, you know, we won't have any trial footage. Mm. And, and I mean, I, I know you're not the type to pat yourself on the back, but the two of you, I mean, you guys essentially saved history. And, and that was a huge, I mean, it's an important part of history that people see this and and see the pain and see this trial. That alone, I think, I mean, the documentary is phenomenal, but that alone is an achievement in itself. Wouldn't you agree, Daniel? Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the biggest, um, I mean, really, I mean, the, the, the biggest assets that Israel has is its archives, and we just keep them in an appalling state. And it's terrible because when you think about it, one million people were murdered in Treblinka. And the only people to survive the war are these 70 people that, like, you know, fought, physically fought, and, you know, had this mutiny and rebellion in Treblinka, and they escaped. And these 70 people lived to tell of what happened. And the Nazis told them, you know, you can say whatever you want, but nobody would ever believe you. Um, And, you know, their testimonies are only on this falling apart videotapes. And, like, that's so important to preserve it just because there are no other evidence of Treblinka. All of the documents and all of the photos were all burnt. So... I mean, that's what we have in order to tell the story of a million dead. And, and I, I was going to ask you this last, but I'll, but I'll ask you now. Where does is is Yossi the same as you? Does he not have a view of whether John was Ivan the Terrible? Does he have a view? Does, what does he feel? Oh, uh, <laughs> exactly like me. He has a very clear view that changes once an hour. <laughs> uh, it's um, it's difficult. Like, you know, we are, we are still waiting for somebody to see the show and say, like, you know, oh, I have proof. Yeah. And let me ask you about a few people in the documentary that I found fascinating. Uh, what what was your take on Mark O'Connor? Was he in over his head? Um. I don't know. I mean, um, first of all, like, you know, I, I, I really do believe he was a good guy. Um, he really tried the best he could um, in order, you know, 
to to save a man that he was sure is being set up by the Russians. Um, his personal motivation uh, was a good motivation, and it did a good job. Um, as to his uh, lawyer skills, um, I will leave it to <laughs> the people in the documentary to comment about that. But they were more critical than I was. The next person I'm going to ask you about, I feel like you could make a documentary on him alone. Um, is Sheftel, is he a showman? Is he? A, and these are other things that people said, not me. A showman? Is he a traitor? Does he care about the law? Is he? I'll say. Is he crazy? Is he all of the above? What is your take on Sheftel? Because I found him, for better or worse, absolutely fascinating. Um, Sheftel is all of the above, but crazy. Um, he is very calculated and not crazy at all. Um, he is just fascinating because. You know, he really pushes, you know, bad taste to the limit. I mean, this is a guy that started out as a very young lawyer uh, representing Mayor Lansky, the Jewish mobster. Mm. Um, then he took up the Demianu case. Um, and then he kept taking <laughs> cases that were even more controversial. Um, and now he has like the number one radio show in Israel um, as an obnoxious uh, radio uh, star. Um, and he holds like the most, um, you know, radical, bigoted uh, views you can imagine. Um, so he is complex. So on the one hand, you know, I have absolutely zero <laughs> um, empathy for his political views. Uh, he's a pretty obnoxious character. Um, and on the other hand, like this guy has guts. Like he really stood against not only the legal system in Israel, but he stood against Israel. He like, you know, he takes pride in saying that he was the most hated man in Israel. Um, and, you know, and now he's a star. Um and it's it's uh, it's complex. I mean, you know, it, it takes a lot of courage to stand against. Um, sorry, <laughs> it, it takes a lot of courage to stand against. Um, you know, a whole country saying like, you know, I believe in this man. I believe he's you know he, he he deserves like the best legal representation he can get no matter what and you know standing against holocaust survivors that you know you cannot dispute them um on the other hand uh, he's a creep <laughs> yes and he's a creep who's very bright you know and he he wears this huge for those of you listening he wears this huge star of david while getting into his german car and it's just he's a very you know if he was just there for the defense, you know, everyone's entitled to a defense. I think the pro one of the prosecutors said that really good guy, and I forget his name off the top of my head. But it's the enthusiasm, the weird enthusiasm, Daniel, that he showed while defending Demuniak. It was just, it was very odd for me to watch somebody with his background kind of, I don't want to, this is over the top perhaps, but give the middle finger to the Israeli people while defending this horrible, I think, person. I don't know. It's the way he approached it with his – the enthusiasm was just like – it caught me off guard a little bit. That was part of the punch in the stomach, I think. Yeah, and like, you know, it's even more troubling when you think of the fact that like the sister of his mother – um, was murdered in Treblinka, and so were a few dozens of his family in Treblinka. So, you know, probably Ivan the Terrible, be it Demianiok or be it somebody else, killed his mother, his mother's sister. Um, and that man is representing somebody that, you know, he is not an idiot. He knew that Demianiok did something wrong in the Holocaust. Um, I don't believe that Sheftel was sure that, you know, Demianiuk was, you know, just a a good guy, just, you know, stumbling into the Second World War. Um, but on the other hand, you know, Sheftel, he is like the most important part of this trial, because if Demianiuk would have a really crappy lawyer that wouldn't defend him with passion, that wouldn't defend him with vigor, 
um, you know, you would say, okay, it was a show trial. You know, you had a lawyer not really doing his job. So, you know, the outcome was pretty clear. Um, and the fact that Sheftel fought so hard made it a really legal trial and not a show trial. Are, are there, you mentioned that, and, and I think I read this, that he has his own radio show. Um, do people still harbor ill will towards what he did? I mean, obviously not because he's got great ratings. He's the number one, you know, radio show. But are there people out there that still, I mean, you're looking at a man who had acid thrown in his face. I'm surprised somebody didn't kill him. I was stunned. I thought for sure he was going to end up dead on the other side, but that caught me off guard. But do do people still have a lot of ill will towards him, Daniel? Um, Not at all. Not at all. I mean, um, you know, now that the show is out, I'm sure it causes some reactions for many people. But I mean, until now, people regarded it as like, you know, Sheftel got the wrong man out of trouble. And like, you know, the Mianyuk wasn't Ivan the Terrible and Sheftel saved the day. Um, I think this show might make some people reconsider that. Is there a part of the documentary that, hit, I mean, uh, with with the uh, uh, exception of the obvious, is there a part of the documentary that hits home with you that even you find difficult watching when you, you know, when you're obviously editing it or watching it? Is there a part that really sticks with you? Oh, I, I couldn't cut uh, the testimonies of the survivors. I mean, it's like I cut them. We put them in the episode and like, you know, we had like a million and one screenings, you know, until we finalized the the offline. And, you know, in each and every one of them, you know, I had to walk out. I mean, for me, it's just, it's too painful. I could, you know, I could cope with the very, very painful graphic element of the show, but just listening to the survivor, that was too much for me. I mean, that really struck home. And I have to say, no matter how many historical videos I see, whether it's actual footage, you know, primary source footage or or a documentary or a movie, it's the site of the concentration camp, the shoes. And it just it's so difficult to watch. It's almost like it's almost like you're watching something that it's so hard to process, because when you try to think about it, the emotions are just leveling it's just I, I don't know that's that's the way i feel is that kind of the way a lot of people feel you think daniel watching this yeah i mean you know it's it was also like a matter of concern for us like you know when we started doing the show it was very clear for us that we don't want any holocaust footage in the show like we wanted it to be more like mind hunter where you hear the voices and you have to imagine um, but like working on it, we started to understand that people in the U S and, you know, in Europe, um, many young people have just like zero understanding of what was going on in the Holocaust. And, you know, when you hear these, you know, these stories and these testimonies, you know, you need to understand that, like, you know, the Holocaust didn't look like Schindler's list, you know, the Holocaust was as gory and as, you know, just, you know, in, in lack of another word, just like as, as horrifying um, as you can imagine. So we decided really like, you know, if we are going to portray what people are talking about when they say Ivan the Terrible, uh, we need to let people really, you know, see what happened. Yeah, I think horrifying is the perfect word to describe it. And I, I'll tell you whose quote I found a little bit horrifying was um, the grandson, Ed Nishnik Jr., when he said, and, and I don't know if you remember this, where he said, you know, if you were in the situation my grandfather was in, life or death, I mean, what are you going to pick? Whatever he did, whenever he, whatever he was, is insignificant to me. I cannot believe he said, like, when I read that and saw, I just can't believe that. Yeah, I mean, you know, for me, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm trying not to judge, um, you know, family members that need to justify something for themselves. I mean, I, I can't imagine what it is to be the grandson of somebody that's being accused of being this monster. And monster, you know, it doesn't matter if it was Ivan the Terrible or just like a mass murderer of 30,000 people. 
Um, I think people need some kind of, you know, justification in their minds, something that they can really, you know, cope with. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm trying not to judge him. Of course, like, you know, I, I find this, uh, this statement pretty appalling. Um, but, you know, I, I, <laughs> I, I do understand that it's coming from somebody that has to cope with a very problematic legacy. Yeah, and, and I'm going to tell you something else I found problematic was, um, and I'll be very brief on this, I'm not going to touch on it a lot, but my mother is from Poland, I'm half Polish, I'm fluent in Polish. I was not okay with the whole map thing that they brought up. When, when it comes to Poland and the Holocaust and World War II, say nothing. Just shut your, Because the more you say, the worse it is. Because well, I'm not going to go into roles and, and point fingers, but you know I mean... Poland could have done a lot of things in better ways, but that's a conversation for, for another time. Um, did you find that, that that to be kind of a pain dealing with that whole situation, Daniel? And if you don't want to answer that, too, I respect that as well. No, not at all. I mean, uh, not at all about uh, happy to answer. Um, I mean, at first, um, you know, it, it made me very furious. I mean, it's very, very problematic on two levels. Um, one, of course, you know, the Polish people have a very troubling uh, relationship uh, to the Holocaust. And, of course, you know, um, the current government of Poland um, is not the most uh, liberal liberal one. Um, and, you know, for me, it's very problematic having politicians uh, call up any network and say, you know, change your film. Um, on the other hand, I must say that, like, you know, um, putting aside uh, the way that they did that, um, I can understand, I can understand their case. I mean, Poland and, you know, us as Israelis or Americans don't really understand it. But for Polish people, um, talking to Polish people, um, a lot of them feel that, you know, they were kind of branded as, you know, the evildoers of the Holocaust and the Germans are kind of treated in a, um, in a lesser or in a different, uh, in a different manner. I mean, you know, for them, they say, you know, we were occupied under Germany. Then they were occupied, of course, you know, under Russia uh, during the Cold War. And they never really survived. I mean, Germany now is prosperous and Poland is not. Uh, and for them, you know, it's very important to say, look, guys, I mean, we had our part in the Holocaust and, you know, we, uh, yes, a lot of us collaborated, yes, but these were not Polish death camps. They were not initiated by the Polish government or the Polish people. These are German death camps, and the Germans did it, and they occupied our land, and they set up all these death camps um, and concentration camps. And, you know, that I, I do respect. I think, like, you know, we added... Um, a text clarifying that these are German death camps during World War II in Poland. And I think it's a good compromise because on the one hand, we can really, you know, address the issue of, yes, it is the Germans. And on the other hand, we do show the geography in which, yes, it is in Poland. So, I mean, I, I do have empathy for their pain about, you know, being portrayed as the only wrongdoers of the Holocaust. Yeah, and, um, and to, yeah, even, even if somebody has a minimal knowledge of World War II in history, knows that Poland didn't initiate and st – like I feel like it was such a – I don't know. As, as somebody who's Polish, I feel like I could speak – I just feel they shouldn't have – I don't want to say they shouldn't have said anything. But I think it's well known throughout history that they didn't – you know, these camps weren't run by Polish people. They were German camps. But I don't know. I just felt like, I, I, I don't know, why call attention on an issue that I, I, I have a lot of problems with what they did to you guys. I, I wasn't okay with that. I mean, I understand where they're coming from, but I almost think it's like assumed, right, Daniel? Is that a stupid way to approach that issue? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, for me, it, it feels ridiculous because, like, you know, every Israeli 
um, you know, can tell you that, you know, the Nazis came from Germany and not from Poland. Um, but, you know, in this era of fake news and people that just believe everything they see online, I don't know. They are pretty, <laughs> there are the, the, the quite a lot of ignorant people out there. And, you know, just clarifying for these people that these are historic facts, um, I can relate to that. Yeah, and I gotta say, Daniel, thank you so much for giving me almost an hour of your time. Is there any future projects you're considering, or anything on the burner that you have going on, or contemplating? I know you got you got a lot of stuff going on in your personal life, very busy and, and so forth. Is there anything you wanted to get out there? Oh, uh, we we are in like now working on like three different very exciting projects. But like as always, I can't talk about them sadly. But um, once they're out, um, <laughs> I'll be happy to come back and blab about them. No, I, I I really appreciate that. The documentary is called "The Devil Next Door." It's one of the best documentaries I've ever seen. Certainly one of the top of the, of this year. Um, wonderful work, Daniel. I, I cannot thank you enough for coming on the show today. His name is Daniel Savan. Daniel, again, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. It was a pleasure.